Hi, and welcome back to the Mob Mentality Show. I'm Chris Lucian, and my co-host is Austin Chadwick. And today we have Brian Finster, and we're going to talk uh, about the fundamentals, dummy, and uh, why <laughs> Agile without feedback loops is dumb, and uh, DDD, uh, CDD, BDD, and why microservices will bite you. So uh, before that, um, maybe we can jump into a quick introduction, Brian, and then get on to the first topic. Uh, yeah, I'm an engineer with Defense Unicorns um, and uh, been spending the last several years trying to figure out how do we can deliver software better, you know, with less pain, uh, less rework, more joy, that sort of thing. Yeah. All right. And what are your thoughts on uh, the fundamentals? Uh, you know, uh, so at, uh, my previous employer, uh, you know, the, the role I had was helping teams directly with continuous delivery and you, know, you go to a conference and everybody's going and looking at, you know, how do we do Kubernetes or machine learning and all these things? And everyone's focused on that. But the, the, the thing that impacts every single team is just the fundal, fundamentals of software engineering in a team environment. Mm. You know, it's the how do we break down work small? How do we get to the details of what something is, remove uncertainty from our, you know, from our work so that we can actually write tests? before we commit the code. You know, I don't care if you're doing test-driven development, but by God, commit tested code, you know? Um, and it, it, there's, you know, just not focusing on delivery pipelines being um, the only way we go. We don't bypass them. We don't just, you know, disable quality gates in an emergency. You know, just the fundamentals of, of just good software engineering. It's not even like clean code. It's just like, do the basics uh, and people skip that and they go for the the shiny stuff and and deliver garbage and wonder why we right. can't stop that thing i uh you know i often talk to people about conferences that i you know suggest versus not and th there's this infatuation with vendor conferences um and you know like reinvent builds uh all the way to um you know, uh, KubeCon and it, mm. it's like, it's like the people putting on the, the, the conference are, are just trying to kind of indoctrinate you into their ecosystem as, as hard as possible, uh, versus the conferences that maybe, um, you know, unconferences I think are, are among some of my favorite, um, where you are talking about, you know, systems thinking, lean, agile, and other things like that. But, you know, I have a really hard time uh, thinking that, you know, a, a $5,000 conference and a Vegas party is, is the right way to spend your time learning about about something going forward. But also, you know, some people just don't even think of testing as a fundamental. I, yeah, you know, this is, um, it, it's, the industry is just really messed up. I mean, it's incredibly frustrating. Um, you know, when I have to argue with people that, yes, test your code, oh, that's the, that's QA's job. You know, you might want to understand the business problem we're trying to solve. No, that's product's job. I'm just here to code and, and make sure I have good algorithms. And I'm like, no, no, you're a software engineer. You're not a typist. Uh, <laughs> what, what are, do you have any suggestions for people in that same scenario facing that same difficulty? Is there, you know? Uh, you mean people who want to do better or people who don't want to do better? Because I have suggestions for both. Yeah, I mean, so so I was referring to the people that maybe don't want to do better or don't even know what better looks like. I, I think that's a really interesting question. No, I, I think people, so yeah, there's 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 buckets, right? There's people yeah. who want to be better and they've seen better and they want to, and they know what better looks like. There's people who don't know what better looks like, but would, would try to be better if they did. Yeah. For those two groups, read Modern Software Engineering by Dave Farley. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think that should be required reading for anybody in the industry, that they should just read Modern Software. That, that's a great book. It's it's like, I read that book. I was like, yes, why didn't I have this as a child? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so good. Um, I got my copy on my birthday. I was so happy. And um, for the for the group that it just doesn't think that uh, things like they should take testing seriously or worry about product, um, I 
I've been saying for a while McDonald's is hiring, but McDonald's requires some quality process. So, you, you know, if you're not interested in quality, perhaps, um, I don't know, digging ditches, it's, it's, it's less precise. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think um, it's, it, it is very tricky. And I think uh, I really like what you said before with the shiny, the shiny things. Uh, and for some reason in my mind, I put them together as shiny garbage. <laughs> Let's make a bunch well, of shiny garbage. Yeah. A lot of times it tends to be shiny garbage because they right, have the right. fundamentals and they go and dive in after the shiny new thing and they release garbage with shiny new thing. Yeah. And, and I think hmm, I'm trying to, I, I wonder the, the philosophical or societal or social underpinnings, like at the system level, where there is this tendency in a lot of things in life, but definitely in tech, and I'll stay there for a little bit to not make it too broad, but is that the new shiny thing will solve the problems, right? So if your pipeline is slow, uh, try a different vendor. You know, if um, you're releasing bugs, you know, maybe a different uh, end end testing tool will solve your problems, right? You know, oh. and, yeah, and so... I'm a photographer as well. Yeah. <laughs> and so if I want to take better pictures, obviously what I do is just buy a more expensive camera. <laughs> I've got some photos I've taken with an uh, that I took with an iPhone 5 that are I love those photos, right? It, you know, it comes down to nailing the fundamentals in everything you do. Uh, there's a, a a video that was on YouTube I'm not YouTube, uh, Netflix a long time ago, and it's, I don't know where it is now, but it's uh, Juro Dreams of Sushi. And he has the best, he's like the number one sushi chef in the world. He didn't want to be a sushi chef. He had no interest in being a sushi chef. He just needed a job, but he decided if he was going to do the job, he was going to master the craft and do it well. So you can be excited about being a software developer and it can be your hobby, or you can just like me, it's not my hobby. I, I do it because it helps people and it's easier than roofing. Okay. I don't have to be in the Texas heat roofing or now the Arkansas heat roofing uh, or cold. Um, it's not my passion, but I, I'm passionate about doing it well. Right. And just master your craft. Learn the fundamentals, focus, practice the fundamentals all the time. I mean, I'm always practicing. How do I get better at CI? How do I write better tests? While I'm also focusing on the broader, how do we implement this brand new, interesting thing? How do we deliver better to submarines? You know, things like that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's simple. Just take the job seriously. Yeah. And, and I think uh, that's one thing I've, because I think there's no way of getting around it. And there is benefit to learning, playing, almost playing the vendor game almost, as you're talking about, Chris, like, because the, the technologies are constantly changing. And so you do need to be aware of them and knowledgeable enough to work with you, them. And you don't want to be in DOS when everyone else is <laughs> automating. You, you do. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and I joke, that, that's the yeah. photographer joke is like, oh, you must have a really good camera. A good camera makes it easier to do a good job. But right. you have how to do a good job with the tool. Right. Do a good job with the tool. Yeah. It's just it just removes some of the toil. Yeah, exactly. And and I think for me, uh, with the dedicated learning time we have in that kind of our working environment, yeah. I usually just split the time. And to be honest, I'll be honest, I, I put more time into the fundamentals than I do the, the tech learning and tools learning. But there is a slice of my time that is spent on learning the, the newer tool, the newer tech, because sometimes those things really do make a big difference and it's awesome. Um, but making sure that the fundamentals are solid in your learning development path, I think is, so it's not necessarily either or, it's a both and, I suspect. Or, I think, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. See, I focus on the fundamentals while I'm doing the work. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how do I get better? I'm, I use my work to do my work better. And right. then I'm also learning about other things I'm not using right away to see if they're going to solve a problem I have now, solve a future problem I come across. Um, I do a lot of work looking at people's dashboards and giving feedback on whether they're destructive or helpful. Uh, you know, and <laughs> things that way as well. So, yeah, always learning. Yeah. What's an example of a destructive dashboard? 
Uh, one that measures individual productivity metrics, uh, even worse, is where it shows people next to each other, so you can compare who's doing. You know, <laughs> that's a that's that's obviously a disruptive rat metric. race, right? Yeah. yeah, or compare teams to each other. You yeah. know, who's deploying more frequently? Yeah, mm -hmm. we'll, I'll do that. Nice. Well, uh, you know, so so that's a good segue actually to the agile without feedback loops. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We have sprints, you know. So you, you have a two week sprint, and then you have a two week testing sprint, and then you deliver at the end of the quarter. Um, it, you know, the the whole thing. Uh, I, I'm, for me personally, my opinion is if you're not if you don't have the ability to deliver daily and you're not getting daily feedback, whether you're delivering to production daily or not, you're in no way, shape, or form agile because you can't respond to events real time, right? And it's it's all about responding to events. And that could be responding to learning from the last delivery. It could be responding to painful learning from the last delivery because everything just blew up. It could be responding to the, the latest security breach that we need to go and patch. Right. If you don't have the ability to immediately respond, you're not agile. So stop saying you are. So, you so two weeks is too long. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know, I, I, I tell teams all the time that if um if if you don't have enough time to get your work done in a two week sprint, use a one week sprint because yeah. the problem isn't that you're not working harder. The problem is that you're plan you're trying to plan for too long a period of time. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to plan for that amount of time. Plan for one week, and then break everything down into like a, you know. I hate the whole scrum thing of a story shouldn't last longer than a sprint. No, a story shouldn't last longer than forty eight hours, because I can't. I, I there's too much uncertainty in a four day story. Yeah. Three day story, you know, and so break things down small and you'll actually learn how to be able to pivot. Or I saw something the other day that just blew my mind. Oh, well, the product owner shouldn't come in and change the sprint goals. No, they should be able to come in and say, hey, tomorrow we need to pivot and stop doing what we're doing now and start doing this next thing because priorities change. And we should have work broken down small enough where we don't have to park the whip. We should just be able to deliver that thing. It's done and move to the next thing because the product priorities change. The, the, the goal is to serve the needs of the product, not to serve our needs. Our wants to have, oh, I don't want things to change. No, sorry, you're in the business of changing things. <laughs> That's literally the job. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and I definitely seen that. Um... And maybe it kind of goes back to what you're talking about before with um I think it it you know, it maybe goes back to awareness because it seems so offensive and ridiculous because you've never seen it. It just feels like a yeah. I guess what it I guess that you know I was at a place um a while back where um the way these kind of principles were perceived like mm -hmm. is you don't change how you work. So ignore the fundamentals, kind of what you're talking about before, but magically just be able to do this stuff, right? Like, right. Yeah. yeah, just yeah. don't make errors, you know, just uh, deliver yeah. every day. A hundred percent. Yeah. Just, I have a lot of empathy for people who yeah. <laughs> think of it that way or have never seen what good looks like because mm -hmm. I had, I've worked with a lot of teams when I was, uh, you know, doing a, a dojo. Mm -hmm. where they they just don't know what good looks like. And so they can't imagine why what they're doing is hurting them. They've always just been in pain, right? Mm -hmm. And so it just feels like normal. I, I started having anger issues when I, uh, uh, like, it's like, why did I not, how, did, how could I have lived this long in pain once I just had the pain go away because we just worked better? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, I didn't know what he tell. This is the job. And yeah, keep doing it's the not job good. and yeah, yeah, it doesn't have to hurt. And uh, all this, except for CSS, all right, CSS. <laughs> yeah, the CSS does have to hurt, yeah, CSS, <laughs> have to hurt. Uh, but, but it doesn't have to hurt. And, and like, so showing people what good looks like and what's possible, uh, yeah. and then having getting them to have enough faith to try, right? Yeah. Just so they can get over the hump, 
and see, oh, things can actually hurt slightly less. I've, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not a, uh, and I'm, I'm talking a lot, not letting you guys talk, but it, it's not a, a way to drive people harder. It's not a, a, you know, just a relentless death march. No, it's freeing up time so we can think, so we can do our jobs better. So uh, when I joined, when I first joined the team uh, that eventually kind of started mobbing together, yeah, um, there was a lot of resistance to changing the way we do things. Like it just, it was like, oh, this agile stuff is like a very pie in the sky type stuff. And we're, we're never going to do that because our context is too complicated. And- um, I always love that by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I trade at Walmart. I really love that. Yeah, and and so like, uh, what's interesting is is that we so we went you know speaking of unconferences we went to the uh, Agile Open SoCal conference yeah. together, and there were teams there that were talking about, you know, just quality of life that people on the team had never experienced before, and um, that was like a key inflection point to which people started considering you know like oh you know maybe kanban can really help us maybe these other things can and and that eventually cascaded to uh hey let's get into a room together and work on this problem because i'm i'm not going to meet my deadline etc cetera, etc cetera. and um and so it, it was really kind of magical and and then i've seen it over and over again when people come and visit our environment is like it's like, oh, I I never even thought you could deploy something to prod in the same day without, you know, a segregation of duties, a yeah. chain of responsibility where, yeah. if, you know, five people are involved in three different departments. And so, you know, sometimes it's just like seeing is believing and, and just getting past that that weird moment where you're like, you know, getting past it's impossible to it's possible that that can get somebody over the hump to just try right yeah you know it's it's funny i i, I keep saying these things on, on like linkedin about how oh you guys are just religious zealots it's like no we see you like banging a nail in with a, a rock and we say hey have you tried a nail gun and then you try to bang the nail the, the nail in with a nail gun say it doesn't swing as well as the rock and then call us religious you know, nail gun zealots it's like <laughs> Well, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, that, that is a little bit of the diffusion of innovation theory and, and the, the bell curve and all that. Um, but it, it's interesting, you know, I think industry wide of how long it has taken to traverse the um, the the curve. And I think a lot of it just has to do with, you know, initially whether or not schools were even teaching things like like when I went. Uh, you know, so so before I went to college, like you know, the text there was no textbook with any excerpt of of Agile. Uh, then when I was in college for computer science, like there was two paragraphs on Agile, and it mainly talked about Scrum, and then that was it. Like no one, and then and then now it, you know there's there's at least discussion. Many schools are teaching unit testing and and other things along those lines, and. and the project management course is some, you know, a comparison between Scrum and Kanban or something. And so, you know, it, 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 it is kind of a factor of like some people dig their heels in for their entire career until they retire. And then, and then others are more willing to travel the curve more. Well, and I, th I think a lot of it comes down to, uh, you know, as people are are like told how to do right you know it's like oh you're going to use two week sprints and you're going to use do with this agile coach we hired from the consulting you know, big consulting company came in and, and we're going to cookie cutter this agile thing and and uh my attitude is number one no frameworks wow. just no frameworks at all and i gave a talk at qcon where i talked about how we ditch safe and you, you know how i feel about that um and replaced it with engineering yeah and we started with the problem to solve we're delivering every quarter management wants us to deliver every two weeks that's terrifying we should try for daily instead yeah. um and you know i i like wrote up on my team's area like a piece of paper that's like you know the rules for continuous integration and it's like why can't we do that Let's solve that problem. Why? How do we solve for continuous integration? Um, right. And then we just hammered at it. 
the uh it kind of reminded me so so like the no frameworks thing like i really really resonates with me because it, it to me it's more about the virtuous cycle it's it's are are you learning and is there an iterative cycle is there an iter an experiment an experiment loop so it's like if you don't have that then it's it, you're just cramming stuff down people's throats right so it's like yeah but also there are teams that have the learning but no ability to experiment or have the experimentation and then hit like a ceiling uh based on the their collective knowledge well and this is another problem we have is is that management is untrained and I, i'm like the question i keep asking is how many people how many managers at toyota don't understand tps sure yeah right why are you qualified to be a software engineering manager if you don't understand good software engineering i mean you don't have to be a hotshot coder but you need to at least understand the fundamentals yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think this is, I, I guess I'm starting to see a paradox with all of this. And I wonder what your, your all thoughts are on this is that <clears throat> it's if you just state the principles without saying how to do it, it can come off as pointing manager inflicting impossibility on you, right? Yeah. And then if you, like, for example, let's deliver every day with no bugs, high quality, you know, uh, you know. Uh, or double down and say what Chris says sometimes, like, oh, multiple times a day or 10 times a day or whatever. <laughs> yeah. uh, I remember when we had the visitor in and they were just shocked by how often we were deploying uh, earlier, uh, last week. Yeah, that was pretty fun. But the the problem is if you just state the high-level principles but don't show you do it. And then the other side of the dilemma is here's a way to do it and then you must do it this specific way, right? And yeah. so it's kind of... It's, so I've had to navigate that. Personally, yeah, right, right? yeah. You know, so that, that first one is like, why can't we do CI? I didn't know either. It's not like I had ways. I just was not telling them, right? It's like, yeah, I'm reading books and consuming things on the internet and throwing stuff at the team mm -hmm. and said, hey, what if we try this? And other team members like, what if we tried this or tried this? Uh, you know, we, we did occasional mob programming uh, just to break up the routine, you know? Um, and so we were all trying different things, but in the dojo, we created all these playbooks based off of the fundamentals that everybody was, was messing up that we had, we had good answers for, but we didn't say, go do this playbook. Like, Hey, here's some problems that you guys have. There are some solutions that have worked from other teams. These might be a good starting point for you, or you might have some other ideas, right? And they'll absolutely dive into something that's like, Hey, oh, well, let's try it. Right. And we even told them how we gave information on those playbooks about how you knew you were doing it well. So you could like, because it's test everything, right? Quality is an environment, not a stage. Uh, so we had, here's how you can assert that this playbook is working or that you might need to adjust something. Right, right. And and, and I love that with the, what you're saying, because you're kind of like, here, here are the principles or the goals and, you know, trying to solve this problem in engineering. We need feedback to be, uh, to have agility, right? And here is a way to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And then I think what you're like, what Chris was talking about, once a way is demonstrated that they can concretely see and feel and touch, you know, in the, in the software way to touch it, so to speak, um, then it's no longer um, just an infliction of an impossibility. It's kind of like, oh, this actually can be done. <laughs> and, and yeah, I, I, I love how, and I think like what you said, one of the first things you said earlier was, well, here's a book from Dave Farley, right? And just just being aware that someone's published something on it and just is it can be the start of someone's journey, I think. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I think uh, Dave's book does a really good job of challenging us to be better us and and giving us some things to to look at to how to get that done, right? Because uh, his stuff does a really good job of navigating that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I'm going to do from this is, you know, I'm sure you, Brian, you've heard of uh, SAD, right? The uh, scaled, uh, scaled, scaled agile. I, I'm a, I'm aware of, of the scaled agile DevOps maturity framework. Yeah. yeah. And so since you're into no frameworks, I'm going to create the uh, Brian Finster framework. And it's just every post you've ever done. I'm going to say every team <laughs> must do everything that was said in one of those. And if you're not, you're not doing the Brian Finster framework. So yeah, I'll get to work on that right after this. So. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it might be a good transition to all the DDD. So DDD, CDD, BDD, and oh, yeah. services. Why these things might 
might come out and bite you. You know, I had a conversation. I was I was talking about the uh, you know the experience of taking a terrible legacy thing. I gave us talk at QCon about taking is this how what we had to do technically to be able to enable continuous delivery was we had to take this giant twenty five line twenty five million line monolith that was like eight hundred tables you know everything tightly coupled with the database um, and and break that up. And I, and I was talking about the process of doing that. And someone asked, well, you know, but microservices are more complex than, than a monolith. I'm like, no, you probably should have looked at that monolith. Uh, it's, you know, there's different complexities, but I've talked to lots of people who've tried to implement microservices and uh, most of them have never heard of domain driven design. And I'm like, you should, you should like start with DDD before you start trying to break up a, mo a, a monolith in the microservices, or you're going to wind up with something that will be impossible to operate. Uh, it will kill you. And, you know, from there, it, one of the other things I talked about in that talk was how important contract driven development was for decoupling teams from each other. And which is tied directly to, you don't even have to do microservice architecture. If you're going to do a service oriented architecture at all, you need to understand how to do contract driven development. And, you know, again, these are just fundamental things that you should understand. And, you know, and, and just for people who don't know, contract driven development means that we either within a team, if we have multiple services on the team or between two teams, even more importantly, define the contract change required for the next feature that impacts those two services, test the contract, and then work outside in on each one of our features and develop in such a way that we can deploy in any, any sequence. And people get this confused with consumer-driven contracts, which is a subset of contract-driven development. So consumer-driven contracts is where I as a consumer say, I need this property, and then you have to go and implement that property. Uh, it's sometimes enforced with tooling, so it breaks your build. Um, there are use cases for that, but not all the time. But contract driven development is just we have a machine testable contract that we have decided on, and then we go and implement outside in, yeah. right? Uh, which means that I can go do integration testing against your contract mock without you, and, and because my team's way faster than yours. Yeah. <laughs> Nice, nice. Yeah, and I think it, it might. So this might be another flavor of uh, the shiny garbage um, uh, thing uh, that you were, we were talking about earlier. Um, and uh, the wrong reason. What's that? <laughs> because microservices. Because microservices. We have to do microservices. I heard it at a, at a uh, conference once. Yeah, it's kind of. It's kind of. Um, I don't know if I would call it in the patterns. It's more like the meta patterns. It's kind of like the big giant patterns, like what's yeah. called like the architectural patterns. Like, like everything I, has to deploy to Kubernetes now. Right, right. Yeah, right. Where it's kind of, I believe it might be a misunderstanding of what architecture means. <laughs> but, it's, <laughs> but it's the idea that, yeah, architecture equals Kubernetes, right? Uh, <laughs> or I microservices. Think yeah. I think it's important to talk about why you want to have microservices because there's a mm -hmm. few good reasons i mean number one a, a monolith is a lot easier to operate as long as it's not also an architectural nightmare internally yeah. um and breaking all the time uh, yeah. <laughs> but but if you have if you're trying to uh, break teams apart giving each team a service improves your ability improves your throughput because you can have people working on different subsets of the business domain at the same time without having to deploy both of them, you know, the one thing at the same, you know, and, and you can't just grow teams larger. It doesn't work. Uh, that just slows everything down. So once, a, once you know, this thing we're working on is too big for one team to support, we do mitosis on the service and break it up. And, and we need to make sure we have a well-designed monolith to do that. That's got clean architecture and means yeah. can break it up. There's a... Um, that reminds me of, so I think a lot of the Shopify videos out there are all yeah. about the majestic monolith, right? They're, they argue real hard for monoliths on all their videos. And, uh, but, but really like when we're talking about it, it's not a war between monoliths and microservices or serverless. It, right it's really oh, like yeah. 
people yeah. want scalability and maintainability and like illities in general and but but a lot of times they don't you know it's just like oh microservices it's, it's a, yeah, I mean, a you, solution you without want, a need sometimes right? you want to spend a crap ton of money on infrastructure deploy a monolith where one small piece of it needs to scale uh yeah. to meet demand and the rest of it doesn't now you have to scale everything everything yeah demand, you know and so um, you know, if you have like some portion of that that's getting hammered, you should break that out into its own service so it can scale. You know, you can have a monolith with some microservices. It's not yeah. you know, to your point. It's not an either or. It's 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 architecture. It's not a religion. Yeah, yeah, and and I think that it you know it it's like you need to be in tune to the trends, right? And cons yeah. but consider them objectively from a distance, right? And then go yeah. in your context, whatever you're at, say, what problem am I trying to solve? And it could be something trendy that helps, a pattern or a tool. It could be something very ancient that uh, is the right. But and I, I also yeah. think it's super important whenever yeah. say, whenever you hear about something like mm. microservices or BDD, which I still want to talk about. Mm. Don't just go and read an article and think you know what it is. Dive <laughs> in, right? Understand yeah. what it actually is. Because like BDD is one of my favorite ones. Anytime I hear, you know, I've heard people say, uh, I went to help a team one time. It's like, oh, yeah, we do BDD. And what they meant was is they had two QA people using Gherkin to write end-to-end -end tests of something that was already done. Yep. <laughs> that was Cucumber. So they had Cucumber, Gherkin tests. I'm like, that, no. No, yeah, I mean, number one, that's cucumber is not BDD, and you're doing it at the very end. Um, and you know, BDD is another one of these things that is often misunderstood. The driven um, part, <laughs> yeah, you need a pencil and a piece of paper or a whiteboard, and hopefully, not a sharpie, probably, hopefully, a dry erase marker, uh, ah. to, do, <laughs> to do BDD, right? I mean, it's just I've saved so much money personally. Well, not my personal money, but I've personally saved company money by going through the process of breaking everything down to acceptance tests and deciding, you know, and us as a team deciding, oh, we don't need to implement that behavior. And so we just deleted it and didn't code it. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine how much money we saved by not sitting down and coding it. Yep. Um, and getting the certainty, you know, giving us a tool. Uh, again, you know, I say break things down small. Well, that's, you know, you hear agile coaches all the time. Oh, you need to just split the story. Okay, bro. I mean, how? And so BDD, you know, you go through the process of breaking things down into very small, discrete behaviors that are tests. And then you can say, I now have a full stack behavior. I can split that off into its own story, potentially, as long as I couple the positive and negative tests for that, that scenario together. Um, and you know, it gives you a, a very good way. I, I consider this the the fundamental thing at Walmart. When I, I started learning about continuous delivery, the very first aha moment we had was discovering BDD. And it was such a powerful tool for us that I started, I built a deck, my very first presentation I ever gave to anybody. And I started running around giving it to other teams in the buildings. Like this is really helping guys. Nice. Um, but I've also heard people talk about how BDD and, and domain driven design are at odds with each other. I saw that one time. I'm like, that makes <laughs> no sense to me whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I think so. Maybe a follow up question in that uh, maybe it's kind of a learning problem because I think for, for me, uh, you won't find that fundamentals matter, the feedback loops are important, that DDD, CDD, BDD. And, you know, which in a sense is kind of the fundamentals. I think one major problem is the quote unquote fundamentals. They feel kind of deep. <laughs> like, for example, if you talk about the fundamentals of, let's say, I don't know, basketball or something, you know, in one sense, it's really simple, but in one another sense, it's really deep. Right. And so. I like, I feel like the learning curve for many is long. Has that been your experience as well or? No, not really. And uh, because. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not, not in my experience. All right. And so mm -hmm. and number one, you have to understand how I learn. I learn because I have a tactical problem to solve. Right. Right. Uh, in most cases. Um, 
and I have a problem in front of me, I need to solve it. I'm, I'm going to learn enough to solve the problem. And then if I hit another roadblock, I'll learn more to solve the problem. I was telling somebody that, you know, when we were, you know, with domain driven design, you have strategic domain driven design and tactical domain driven design tacticals in the code strategic is about the architecture including team architecture for a large enough thing right mm -hmm. we needed to we needed to modify our architecture we didn't know it was called the reverse conway maneuver at the time though we did know about conway's law we needed to architect the teams to do that I, I, I and the others who were on this effort, we didn't go and buy Eric Evans' book and read it from cover to cover and become experts at DDD. Uh, I found like a, it was like a, the quick guide thing and, and learned just enough to get through this process of how do we break up the teams the right way, mm. right? Um, and so just do just in time learning of the thing that you, the next thing you need to tackle. With behavior-driven development, that took a lot of practice. That took me watching a lot of videos because the, the hard part with BDD as an engineer is to not think in implementation. And looking at every single test as you're going through, you know, each one of those scenarios as you're doing it and saying, okay, we're going to write it wrong and then we're going to strip out the implementation details and then make it make sense. Mm -hmm. And learning to not think in implementation, think of the business, you know, behavior you're trying to implement. That was the hardest thing for me. And it just takes practice. It's like riding a bicycle. That takes practice too, right? You can't just fall off a bike and say, yep, that doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Contract driven development was a lot easier. It was just convincing people to stop sending, uh, you know, kind of vague descriptions of Jason in email. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I've been like, on the. We're gonna use swagger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I've been on that contractor and development journey before too, where you see that going on, and then you you step in. So yeah, that just in time learning for the problem at hand, I yeah. think lowers the bar in a reasonable way, right? Because it's, I mean, you, you get if you're looking at the original DDD book, it's big, right? Or if you look at oh, any yeah. book on BDD, it's I've big. Never read the, I've never read that that whole book. Yeah. Right. And so I think so if if it's it's almost comes back to the messaging problem we we're talking about earlier, it's not like reach this ideal and you have just to conjure a way out of nothing. Right. <laughs> or learn. Yeah, DDD. I mean, I'll go ahead. I'm sorry. When I was learning how to test. Yeah. One of the things I've, I stumbled on was actually unit test patterns. And I spent the eighty dollars for that book. Mm -hmm. That book has a killer feature, which is anti-patterns and solutions inside the back cover where there's normally just like white paper on most books. It's like this thing is that dense that there's text mm -hmm. on the inside of the hard cover, right? <laughs> and that's how I consumed that book, right? It was like I was looking for this problem. Okay, flip this page and it discusses that problem and, the, and potential solutions. I didn't mm -hmm. read that 900-page book. Mm -hmm. yep. I solved the problems that I had in front of me. Nice. And yeah. this is the 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 approach, you know, the uh, you know, you, you guys know about minimumcd.org, right? Yes. Okay, well, that was a project that we put together and we specifically um, you know, because people are hurting themselves with CD because they're not looking at it the right way. And and we specifically framed it as problems to solve not solutions. There are things in there with like experience reports and things that people have tried that have worked and go look at here, look at, you know, this content over here from Nick Farley and just humble and like, you know, the, like all these other things, um, you know, uh, Liz Keo, you know, all these great people that have helped us learn, go look at this material, but solve these problems. If you can solve these problems, you know, you're doing it correctly. If you haven't solved these problems, you're not doing it correctly. Nice. Nice. Yeah. And I think you're right. The problem solving mindset. Uh, and we're going to ask you if you have anything to plug uh, here in here in a couple of minutes. But one thing I will plug is uh, just sharing a way, but uh, um, that I know you're familiar with it, uh, Brian, but uh, is that one, one thing that's really nice about my programming is you're in the flow of the current problem. Mm -hmm. And if there's someone who has the expertise, whether it's shorter feedback loops, fundamentals of testing or CD, they can help share in that moment and help and, you know, show what it looks like, right? <laughs> and yeah. help others learn 
and you know even start learning sessions or give guidance on things to learn on the side it's it's a natural way a way to to kind of do what you're talking about without needing to read the 900 page book but even without mobbing i see what you're saying like i'm currently experiencing a problem let me research solutions to it um with with these kind of feelers out there right and i could see that helping a lot yeah and i was in a situation where i was the one who was trying to lead the charge to help us get there and nobody else on the team knew either right <laughs> mobbing wouldn't have helped us for that yes. problem uh, you know, and these were the big gnarly things that we had to, you know, like, how do you write a good unit test? You know, we did, we did do mobbing on things when we were trying to move, uh, people from Java to node. Um, we did a lot of mobbing sessions. We were trying to help people, uh, translate and understand that even though JavaScript kind of looks like Java for the love of God, don't treat it like <laughs> Java. <laughs> it's, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> mobbing accelerates the diffusion of innovation curve among a group of people for sure like it, yeah that's uh, one of the key benefits of the practice i think and you know th this past couple of weeks when i've been fighting css if i'd had somebody anybody i could have like paired with yeah. uh, it probably only would have taken one week instead of two mm -hmm. yeah, yeah 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 there's a there's one uh individual i always bring in whenever it's like the slightest amount of CSS and HTML pain. I pull them in immediately. It's like, save us before this turns into a <laughs> terrible uh, fight with the blinds that never ends, right? Where you're like loosening and tightening them and them getting tangled. <laughs> uh, there's another one. Front-end developers who tell me that you don't have to test the front end because all the business logic's in the back end. I just want to smack them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's more to test than business logic. <laughs> yeah. Nice, nice. Um, cool, 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 cool. Well, we are kind of reaching our time box. Uh, and so uh, it's been a lot of fun as it always is, Brian. Um, and uh, yeah, anything you want to share, plug before we close? Uh, well, of course, you know, minimumcd.org. And we keep getting feedback from globally that it's helping people. People will just go out there and throw posts and say, hey, you should go look at minimumcd.org. So that, the fact that we built something that people are finding useful and that started as basically a rant uh, is good. Um, of course, the Scaled Agile DevOps Maturity Framework. If you go to sadmf.com, um, you know, our sales team isn't great because, you know, the certifications are a lot less expensive than other certifications out there. So we can't wait <laughs> for the sales team. Um, but other people find this value in that as well. Um, and also, um, there's the Dojo Consortium. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but dojoconsortium.org. Uh, I was able to open source uh, most of the playbooks that we built inside the, the Walmart Dojo. Um, and uh, there's a lot of content that has helped a lot of teams out there. It's just not, I, I don't push it enough. Yeah, and uh, one other thing, uh, a friend of mine, Tracy Bannon, and I, we we were having we kept having coffee in the mornings uh, once a week, and decided this uh, and and bantering back and forth. We're both very uh, passionate about what we talk about, and sometimes we agree, and sometimes we don't. And um, we decided we should turn that into a podcast. So we've been going on for about eighteen months now, uh, average about one in one a month, really. So if you go to the Dev Hops podcast on YouTube. Like for me and Tracy Bannon, we've had lots of good guests. We had Dave Farley on. We've had Bill Spiergraven, who was the director of platform at Walmart, on a couple times. Um, you know, we we keep getting people to come and, and share with us. So, yeah. Right on, right on. Well, thanks again, Brian. Always love having your passion and your insights. And uh, it's great going back and forth with you to our audience. Uh, if there's anybody uh, out there who you think might need a uh, you know, some inspiration on fundamentals and feedback loops and DDD, CDDD, or anybody who's maybe addicted to uh, shininess and, uh, uh, you know, maybe there might be some balance in their uh, shininess diet. Uh, that might be something to share with them. And we love all your feedback, uh, you, uh, constructive or positive feedback. We love hearing it on all the different ways, uh, whether LinkedIn Twitter, YouTube, or more. Uh, so please uh, reach out and like, subscribe, and we'll talk to you all later. Have a good one. Bye.